With the release of the new DLC, Gathering Storm, Civilization VI boasts arguably the most comprehensive implementation of climate change in a mainstream video game. While climate change has been featured in many titles in the past, this is mostly as either a plot point or as a setting, and it's rare for it to be used as a game mechanic, which is why I wanted to look in detail at how civilization implements climate change, how it affects the gameplay, and assessing how accurate its implementation is. I've been playing games in the Civilization franchise since about 2003 when I picked up Civ 3, and I've played every PC game and every expansion with the exception of Civ 4 Beyond the Sword, though the game which I've played the least of is Civ 6, because that came out right in the middle of when I was doing my PhD in atmospheric science. So it's kind of fitting that the DLC coming out about climate change is what's drawing me back into the game. For the record, thank you very much 2K for sourcing me out with a press code for the expansion via the Yogscast, who I did a live stream with, which is going to be broken up into lots of parts if you'd like to watch my terrible misplays. I've really enjoyed playing the DLC, and I can see myself sinking dozens and dozens of hours into the game from here, so thanks for ruining my productivity 2K. For those of you who might not be aware of how Civ works, in the game you take a civilization from the year 4000 BC and you can take it right the way up to, well, past the year 2000 AD. The game consists of building and improving cities, training military and non-military units, using the terrain to your advantage, building wonders, and then winning via a number of victory conditions. You can wipe out your opponents with warfare, you can overwhelm them with culture, or now you can actually win diplomatically as well. Gathering Storm introduces an impressive amount of new content but the most relevant to us in this video is the way that it implements natural disasters and climate change. So briefly, how does it work? Extreme weather events now happen in the game world. These include storms, river floods, droughts, and volcanic activity. Some have only negative consequences, while others have negative and positive aspects. These disasters will happen regardless of what the player or players do in the game. The more interesting aspect, as far as I'm concerned, is how the game handles climate change. The game now splits strategic resources into material and power. Material is things like iron and horses, while power is coal, oil and uranium. As well as being able to build a factory in your industrial zones, you can now also build power plants. And if your city is powered, then various parts of the city become more effective, generating more production, for example. Burning these fuels, however, contribute to the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And increases in the CO2 level of the atmosphere can lead to a variety of outcomes. The game neatly represents this on this screen, where you can see the CO2 levels, the contribution that my civilization, in this case Sweden, has made to them, the increase in global temperature, so 0.7 degrees Celsius since the ancient era, the percentage of polar ice lost, and the sea level increase. So already we're seeing a multifaceted implementation of climate change, which is really cool. On this other screen, you can also see which civilizations have contributed the most carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and also which fuels have been responsible for the most emissions. In this particular game's case, I, because I industrialized first, have contributed most of the carbon dioxide, and most of that has been through coal. I recently implemented oil power plants and started building things like battleships, which burn oil rather than coal, and so this contribution has only recently been added. Okay, so first impressions of the system is that this is a really good implementation of how human activities force the world's climate. And it's actually got quite a few subtleties which are quite satisfying. For example, note that it's the total amount of carbon dioxide that's been added to the atmosphere that actually forces the climate. Rather than worrying about a particular CO2 concentration, it's the total amount of carbon that's been emitted which is the key factor. What's also cool is that the effects of those emissions are lagged. There are various stages to climate change, going from phase one, with just half a meter of sea level rise, and going all the way up to phase seven, which in the first game I played, we actually hit by the year 1918. We'd, we'd, we'd really messed up the world. That lag is something that we see in the real world, between emissions and effects. In the real world case, that is largely because of the fact that the oceans are absorbing an awful lot of the carbon, resulting in ocean acidification, and an awful lot of the heat, resulting in much warmer oceans. Obviously, the climate change being felt in discrete, quantized chunks isn't realistic, but this is a game based on tiles, so it kind of has to be done. 
Increases in global temperature as a result of changes in CO2 levels are mostly felt through changes in the polar ice coverage and changes in the sea level. When settling a city, you are shown where is low-lying land, and you can make changes accordingly depending on where you want to build cities and districts. In the first game I played, this was absolutely devastating because we really churned through all of the stages of climate change because everybody industrialized very quickly. That meant that people lost wonders they built, they lost out on districts, they built. They don't think anybody actually lost a city, but in theory, it is possible to just lose a city completely. The oh. level two stuff has been flooded now. Uh oh, I think that's my. Oh, that might Jesus be hitting me now. Actually, Christ. I'm losing everything. No, <laughs> no, my industrial zone. My commercial zone. My last <laughs> one. My oh, rice yeah. paddy. <laughs> but I think the most impressive aspect of how Gathering Storm implements this is through the extreme event system, which is why I brought it up in the first place. On this screen, you can see that there is a chance of a particular event happening. Now. That is largely determined by the frequency that you set at the start of the game. You can make there be lots of disasters or not very many disasters. But underneath, you can see that in the case of storms, there's actually been an increased chance of storms happening because of increases in the CO2 level in the atmosphere. This is an aspect of climate change that doesn't get represented very often, and it's actually one of the most worrying aspects. Increased frequency of extreme weather events such as hurricanes, floods, sandstorms, even extreme outbreaks of cold air can be directly attributed to increases in CO2 concentrations. So as well as flooding and submerging tiles close to the coast, the game punishes you for emitting carbon dioxide by giving you more of these extreme events. Arguably though, where the game really shines is how all of these changes will affect the gameplay. Because arguably the scariest thing about a changing climate is the changes in human behaviour that it will cause. If this river around my city, which I can't pronounce, floods over and over and over again, destroying my districts and farms, I'm more likely to, say, stuff this and go and conquer, for example, Cairo in an attempt to get further resources without having to worry about them being destroyed. Although admittedly there is this volcano here. Volcanoes are devastating in this. Volcano what made you think this was a good place to settle your capital? Honestly, look at I this. I don't know! Changes in sea ice with it retreating will result in new pathways being open at the top and bottom of the map, potentially leaving new resources open for exploitation, such as oil, but also new routes for invasion. In general, we anticipate there's going to be more human migration and more conflict in a world feeling the effects of anthropogenic climate change, and that's something which seems to be represented in gathering storm. That's not even something that was programmed into the game, it's just something that happens as a result of human behaviour, which I think is really cool. Another interesting point is that the game effectively forces you to use fossil fuels. If you don't utilise power in your economy, then you're at a massive production disadvantage. And early in the game, the only way to get power is through coal or through oil, both of which emit a lot of carbon. Though coal comes first and emits the most, then oil comes a little bit later on and emits slightly less carbon. It's only with the advent of more modern technologies that you can build geothermal plants nuclear power plants and hydroelectric dams. So in a sense, the game views anthropogenic climate change as an inevitable consequence of human civilization. Again, it's an interesting consequence of the game, not so much in the mechanic itself, but in its implications for the meta, if you like. So on the whole, Gathering Storm, I think, does a really good job of representing what anthropogenic climate change will look like. Of course, it doesn't get everything right. For example, you would expect to see a certain amount of natural variability over the 6,000 years of the game's runtime Though because of the nature of the game and the fact that it's based on tiles, I can see why they didn't implement this. Also, I'm sure some people will take exception to the fact that the game bills nuclear power as being almost completely carbon neutral. The status of how carbon neutral nuclear is is kind of up for debate and it depends on how you define it, but for the purposes of the game, again, I can see why they did this. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the game breaks down climate change into these discrete levels from level 1 to level 7. By the time you reach level 7, the sea level will have risen 3.5 meters, 85% of the polar ice will have gone, but there's no real reason why it would just stop then. In the first game I played, we should have seen much, much worse starting to happen. At that point, the game could start introducing things like desertification, large areas of land becoming arid, 
further sea level rise. Although the game then runs a risk of basically becoming a map of worms where the water level just keeps rising and rising until presumably the Inca are left. But this is one area that I feel like the game could have expanded on. Perhaps they just didn't think that anybody would get to climate change level 7, but in my first game we demonstrated that it was very possible. Overall though, I think the DLC does a fantastic job, and it's a really great way of getting this information out there to the general public. It's a pretty faithful version of what an Earth with an arbitrary level of CO2 emitted by human civilization will look like. I think it's interesting though that all this information is available to the players in the game from the very beginning. When you've settled your first city, you can actually decide to move it away from the coast if you're in danger of your capital city being flooded as a result of climate change happening five or six thousand years in the future. I would argue that that's an unrealistic part of the adaptation, but of course this is how games work. You have to know how to be able to play them. Perhaps if we'd known the radiative effects of burning fuels to further our economies from in the beginning, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now. And I can't help but wonder if the real life industrial age eras had access to their very own civilopedia, would they have made the same decisions that they made? Thanks again to 2K for providing access to the game. I've really, really enjoyed playing it. The DLC adds a huge amount. Civ feels really challenging again now, and I can't wait to play more after this video is out. I hope you enjoyed the video. Do give it a like if you did. And if you enjoyed it, do let me know in the comments because I'd not done anything like this on my channel before and possibly I could do more on the interplay of science and video games. To be honest, any excuse to just play some more. Thanks again. I'll see you in the next one.